Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Alejandro Gallego-Smith, and I'm going to be sharing, uh, sharing today uh, this uh, Sustainable Future uh, Seminar. Uh, we have two great uh, speakers uh, today. Uh, the format is going to be the following. Each speaker is going to speak for uh, 20 minutes, and after each of the, um, the talks, there is going to be roughly 10 minutes for, for uh, questions. Okay, so we are going to start with uh, so since which um, uh, I think you have a presentation to to that you are going to be sharing. Uh, so we, it's a um, uh, PhD researcher uh, that is working in the Department of uh, Materials, and uh, her work is uh, particularly focused in the uh, improvement of plastics. And today she's going to be presenting uh, recycled content uh, determination through aggregation induced uh, emissions. Whenever you're ready. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Alejandro, for the introduction. So, yeah, just to reiterate, I'm a PhD student in Professor Michael Shaver's group in the Department of Materials. And today I'll be presenting some of my work, which I've been completing with Dr. Thomas Bennett on recycled content determination through aggregation induced emission. So to just give you guys a bit of context surrounding our current plastics economy. Uh, so we live in a linear plastics economy, which means that plastics are produced, we use them, and then they're disposed of by a landfill or a loss to the environment as uh, pollution. This continual generation or production of new plastic means that in the year 2019, 460 million tonnes of plastic were produced. The main problem, of course, generation of new material at such a big scale is not great, What's really the worst part is that only 16% uh, of this plastic is actually recycled. And this number actually doesn't refer to how much is properly recycled, but rather to how much is collected for recycling. The actual amount of plastic recycled is about 2% globally, which is extremely poor. The rest of plastic is either sent to landfill, and that's about 40% of plastics worldwide, or again, lost to the environment as pollution, and you end up with really terrible looking beaches. When we talk about recycling, we're really talking about mechanical recycling. And so waste, which is either coming from industrial stems or domestic, so household wastes that you might be sorting yourself at home, are collected and then sorted into uh, mono streams of plastic. And this, is, this can be sorted using near-infrared techniques, density, so does the plastic float or sink in water, or optical sorting techniques. We do this to produce a monostream of plastic, and this is extremely important because contaminants such as metals or foodstuff or dyes really need to be removed to try and maintain the quality of recycled plastic. And after this is done, it can be extruded. So this is the actual recycling process itself, and it involves heat and shear, so two big screws that turn together at high temperatures to melt, blend and homogenize plastics. The homogenized stream can then be remanufactured into new products, and this cycle can continue on and on in theory um, in terms of recycling. So the real challenge surrounding plastic recycling is that extrusion, so mechanical recycling, actually causes degradation of plastics. Now, I know everyone in here is probably not a plastic specialist, so I'd like you to imagine plastics as a kind of string or a series of beads on a long string. And so when the plastics are mechanically recycled, these long strings of beads can be chopped up in processes called chain scission, or they could, you can have new reactions which increases the length of some parts of the string. The problem with the changes to these strings is that they actually change the properties of the final plastic. So if you think about a plastic water bottle, if it becomes more brittle, then it's no longer very useful as a product. You can also have thermal uh, changes in your plastic, which means that the plastics are no longer as stable to high temperatures, or you can even have cosmetic changes. So some plastics become more yellow with recycling. So the problem of plastic recycling is both an economic issue and a technical issue. So from a scientific or technical standpoint, the plastic becomes useless after a certain number of recycles. And in terms of an economic standpoint, you can imagine that a manufacturer doesn't want to make new products with yellow or brittle plastic. So to try and curb landfilling and increase the amount of recycled content that manufacturers are using, um, there are ta new taxation schemes around the globe that tax products that contain less than a certain minimum uh, amount of recycled plastic. 
So in the UK, this tax was introduced in April of this year, and it taxes plastic products that contain less than a minimum of 30% recycled plastic content. Um, but now we end up with a new problem. So how do we actually determine the recycled content of a final plastic product? There are two approaches that have been kind of uh, suggested. The first is the mass balance approach, which looks at recycled content or recycled plastic coming into a recycling facility or manufacturing recycle uh, facility, sorry, and how much is coming out or at molecular weight estimations. So what we mean by molecular weight estimations is if you remember that string bead model is how many beads do we have? How long is that beaded string? The problem with these approaches is that they are process dependent. So the length of that beaded string depends on the exact recycling conditions that are used. They're also easily falsified. So if you think about an approach where you're looking at how much recycled plastic is coming in versus how much is coming out, we don't really know what's going in between the two. Could there be some sort of falsification in there or fraud um, that the, the manufacturers are actually doing inside the facilities? Um, the, these kind of approaches are also disrupted by the use of additives. So some manufacturer, manufacturers include uh, additives to try and improve the properties of the plastics, but these can then actually affect uh, the recycled content determination uh, using the mass balance or the molecular weight estimation approach. And so far, these approaches only apply to mechanically recycled plastics. So across Europe now, um, there are new recycling technologies such as chemical recycling that are coming into play. But unfortunately, these are much more difficult um, to determine how much is going into new products. So this is where uh, our research comes in. So we use an FDA approved fluorescent marker named BBS that we blend with recycled uh, plastic through extrusion to produce what we call a fluorescent recycled master batch. We then blend this with virgin plastic to simulate a, an industrial recycling process to produce what we then call mixed products, which are samples where we can vary the amount of recycled content with respect to the actual amount of virgin plastic that we've also added in. We can then quantify the fluorescence behavioral changes that we see with increasing recycled content and so increasing fluorescent dye. Now, again, I'm, I'm aware that not everyone here might know about uh, fluorescence, so I'll just give a brief overview of how it works. So you start off with a fluorophore, so a fluorescent molecule, and it has electrons that are sitting in a very stable ground state. You have wavelength or light that comes in, excites those electrons to an unstable excited state, and from there these electrons decay and there's more light that's emitted. The light that's emitted is usually of a longer wavelength than the incident light. And you normally find that dyes have aromatic groups or um, very easily excitable electrons, which end up with a strong fluorescence. So within our research, we use a dye called 4,4-bis-2-benzo-oxazyl-stilbene, which I'll be calling BBS from now on because it's a lot easier to say and shorter. And it actually exists in two forms with very distinct fluorescent properties. The first is its molecularly dispersed form. So what this means is that the dye molecules sit within a polymer matrix, completely uninteracting, and it fluoresces this nice deep blue color, which you can see on the bottom left. We can measure the fluorescence emission of the dyes within the sample, uh, and we see we have a fluorescence spectra with three main transitions corresponding to different transitions in electrons uh, within the molecule. Above a certain concentration, though, it becomes more energetically favorable to, for the dye molecules to start to stack within the plastic, and we call this the aggregated form. What we see is a shift in the fluorescence to, more, to a more kind of turquoise color, and if you look at the fluorescence emission spectrum and compare it to that of when the dye molecules are uninteracting, you'll see that some of the peaks are actually shifted to a higher wavelength. This can very briefly be explained by something that sounds scary, but isn't, isn't too complicated in theory, uh, called molecular exciton coupling theory. So what this means is that when the aggregates are in the, sorry, when the molecules or the monomer, the dye molecules are in their monomeric form, their transition dipole moments are completely uninteracting, and you just have the electrons sitting in the ground state that can be excited into the first excited state. Above that certain concentration, the dipole moments start to uh, align, and you actually get splitting of that unstable excited state into two excited states, one of which is lower in energy. And because the wavelength is in proportion, 
inversely proportional to the energy, we get that red shift in the uh, fluorescence emission. So it goes from that deep blue color to a more green or red shifted turquoise color. So using the aggregation behavior of BBS, we can actually exploit this, as I've said uh, before, to mark the recycled content in plastics. So here on the left, I have a recycling simulation that we've produced where we've taken our fluorescent master batch and diluted it with certain amount of virgin plastic. So on the left, you have 0% recycled content, which means we have zero BBS molecules. And then we can go all the way up to 100% recycled content where we have our highest level of BBS molecules and so highest aggregation uh, level. We can then quantify this, what we see as a color change using three different uh, fluorescence measurements. The first are fluorescence emission spectra, the second are lifetime measurements, and the third are color analysis of digital pictures of our samples fluorescing, a bit like the one on the left here. So first I'll talk a little bit about the fluorescence emission measurements. So hopefully you can see here that we have in dark blue, 10% recycled content going all the way up to 100% recycled content in the yellow. And you'll see that there's a bit of a shift in the fluorescence emission spectra around the 470 nanometers and around the 500 nanometers here. If we actually look at what this looks like under a confocal microscope, we see that when we increase from 50% recycled content and double this to 100% recycled content, we see one, an increase in the number of aggregates, aggregates and two, uh, an increase in the size of the aggregates. And we can actually use this to our advantage and plot the ratio between the peaks corresponding to the new amount and the bigger size of aggregates to a uh, reference peak that I've highlighted here. And once we calculate the ratio between these two new bands to that original peak, we actually get a really nice linear relationship between the intensity ratio and our recycled content. Meaning that if we have an unknown sample, we can then refer back to how much recycled content there is in the actual sample. We wanted to then check, well, can we have a secondary check of recycled content? Once we had this first, can we add another layer so we can provide fraud or fraudulent marking of recycled content? So if you remember back to when I was talking about fluorescence, I mentioned that the electrons are excited into an unstable state and then they decay back down. The amount of time the electrons spend in that unstable state before it decays can actually probe, can actually be probed with a measurement called fluorescent lifetimes. And so what we can do is we measure the fluorescence lifetimes of our diluted samples. So again, from 10% recycled content in dark blue up to 100% recycled content in the yellow. And what we see is a broadening of our lifetime data. Now, this looks like a pretty plot, well, from my point of view anyway, but it doesn't actually tell us much unless we analyze it. So we can then uh, fit a multi-exponential decay curve, and we find that there are two main contributions to our lifetime data. The first is a contribution from the monomeric form of the dye, and the second is a contribution from the dimer or from the aggregated state of the dye. We can then plot the change in the dimeric or long-lived contribution to the lifetime against recycled content. And once again, we see a very nice linear relationship with this lifetime param parameter and increasing recycled content. We did start to notice a slight quenching of fluorescence at high recycled contents. And we believe this is because of something called aggregation induced quenching, uh, which is to do with some kind of quite complicated uh, electron transfers within the system. So I won't really touch upon this today, but the good news is, is when we decrease our ma starting master batch concentration, uh, this quenching disappears and the nice linear relationship uh, returns. So we also thought, well, when we illuminate our samples under UV light, we can actually see with the naked eye that there's a difference in color of our samples. So what we ended up doing was taking pictures of our samples fluorescing under UV light in the dark, and we were able to use digital analysis techniques to actually quantify this color change. Now we did this across three different color spaces, including LAB, RGB, and hue saturation brightness, but I'll only uh, draw your attention to the middle one here, which is the uh, red, green, blue color system, which hopefully most people might be familiar with. What we see is a linear, again, increase in the green value of the samples with increasing recycled content. Now it's important to note that when we think of this in you know, the real life or in, on an industrial scale, we don't really see these col color measurements as a quantitative, analysis of recycled content, but we kind of see it working like pH paper. So, you know, you would be given a set of standard samples with 
set recycled contents and then if you have an unknown sample you could compare it to those to try and gauge maybe okay are we around 30 percent recycled content or are we around 100. So if you remember again as well at the beginning of my presentation I kind of delved into the uh, changes in properties you can get with recycled plastics so I mentioned that they can become more brittle or their thermal properties can change and so it was important for us to kind of try and understand whether using our marker, so using BBS would actually affect the properties in the plastics. The good news is that we found no correlation between the viscosity of the plastic at melt, so meaning how well it flows when it's melted, uh, the strength and ductility of the plastics weren't changed with increasing recycled content or increasing BBS content. And we also saw that there was no change in the crystallinity or the thermal properties with increasing recycled content. So hopefully uh, through this, I've managed to convince you that aggregation induced enhanced emission of BBS and packaging allows this multi branch verification of recycled content. Well, I didn't really go through it today, but that we've also expanded the scope of this research to also include that it's process independent. So the actual recycling conditions that we use to incorporate the BBS has no effect on the final quantification of recycled content. It's completely sample size independent. So we originally started with small rectangular samples, but then we expanded this to new shapes and there was no change in our recycled content determination values. It's also additive proof and it works with colored plastics as well. So we've tested this in red, blue, yellow, white and black plastics. And this for us was a really exciting result because it's notoriously difficult to mark and sort black plastics in general. So that the technology works in black plastic is very, very exciting. We've also shown that it has no effect on material properties. It's compatible with a multitude of plastics, so different types of plastic bottles, um, films, uh, this kind of thing. And it also has no effect on the waste sorting processes uh, that are used to sort plastics from that mixed waste stream into the monostream for recycling. Now, I've been very lucky that my research has been so successful. And with the help of the University of Manchester's Innovation Factory, we've actually spun this research out into a not-for-profit spin-out company where we're working with OPRL, the on-package recycling labours, to develop a trust mark for manufacturers to prove how much recycled content is in their plastic packaging or plastic products. We're also hoping to support the UK government on the plastic packaging tax, so to try and help mark that thir minimum 30% recycled content. And just to give you an idea of the scale of this problem, in the UK we use 2 million tonnes of uh, plastic packaging per year, and globally this amounts to 9 billion tonnes of plastic waste per year. So you can imagine that if we're able or if everyone is able to use a minimum of 30% recycled content in their packaging, we might be able to try and curb this number and reduce it down and recycle more of our waste. A big thanks to my research group and to the University of Manchester, as well as the University of Manchester's, Manchester's Innovation Factory. And thank you very much for listening today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sui, for the excellent uh, presentation. Uh, we are encourage, encourage everyone to make uh, questions in the chat. Uh, I don't see any any questions at the uh, moment, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start myself <laughs> with with one uh, in order that in order that people start to not be so afraid of making questions. So I'm gonna break the eyes. So. Um, I was wondering again. Uh, congratulations for the for the excellent presentation. So I was wondering what happened if um, your incoming uh, waste stream is already marked with uh, this flow fluorescent uh, dye. So what 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 will happen in that in that uh, in that uh, case? Yeah. So as we've been moving towards scaling this up industrially, these are some of the questions that have actually come up. So you know. You can imagine we're like, oh, great, everything's marked with our dye, perfect. But then when it comes back in, we do have this problem of, well, how do we make sure that whatever comes out of the recycling facility goes back to the same concentration? So we imagine this as we'd measure the recycled content um, and say it was 30%. We would then top this back up so that the final product ends up with the starting master batch concentration, which I can reveal is 0.1%. So if we know that our incoming plastic has an average concentration of 
0.01%. We can then top it up with a dye to get it back to 0.1% before it's shipped out and re-diluted to make new products. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes, it makes sense. <laughs> um, I think people is, is shy today. I ah, know we have um, one question. Yeah, I see it. So I can read it. I don't know, Meta, if you want to make the question directly. Oh, oh, oh. Um, I can, I don't know if Meta is with us. Okay, so basically uh, putting additional substances into plastic packaging will not solve plastic pollution problem, but it still increase the demand of building plastic produce. Plastics uh, are not recycled uh, infinitely, which will lead to pollution uh, still. Most recyclable materials are still being shipped from Europe to Asia. Money should be invested into changing the system under usable <coughs> system. Um, it's not a question, it's, it's more a reflection. So I don't know if uh, so if you want to add something regarding this. I mean, I can, I can discuss it a little. I, I would agree. I think the problem is not... It is the problem is that plastics are not designed with end of life in mind. They are being designed as okay, we can use them, they're lightweight, they're really cheap, okay, and then we'll just get rid of them. So I agree. I think we do need to change the system. We need to put more, we need to enhance the amount of reuse. So reusing plastics is the number one thing you can do uh, in terms of plastic waste. But then the next thing we need to look into is okay, well, how do we deal with the plastic waste that we already have? So I agree, it's about changing the system and making sure that the plastics are already in circulation are being redirected for recycling. And so that's why if we're able to mark the recycled content of plastics and make it a cheap enough solution for manufacturers to mark and to actually use recycled plastics, hopefully this will increase the number of manufacturers using recycled plastic rather than just buying new virgin plastic all the time. But I agree, it's a very complex problem. There's no one easy solution because Plastic free, I'm not, I'm not going to go into that, but a, pl a zero plastic world is not the answer either to the problem. Yeah, definitely it's a, it's a topic that we can be yeah. <laughs> for days. No? Uh, so um, we have a question from Stephen. I don't know, Stephen, if you want to make the question directly. Uh, no, I can read it then. Um, <laughs> Uh, is it possible to use the dye to indicate plastic for other uses uh, if it's not suitable for, uh, for example, packaging through the degrading? And he congratulates you for the great talk. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny that um, you ask this question because my original... Uh, yeah, so my original uh, PhD project, rather than looking at marking recycled content, I was go initially trying to mark how many times something had been recycled so that once it had hit a point of no return, if you will, like, OK, this is no longer able to be used in packaging, it would be sent for some other type of um, recycling, such as chemical recycling. Um, but it didn't work. My project didn't work very well. And that's how I ended up in this other uh, research kind of pathway. So I think for this to work, you would need you would need a different fluorophore because if you want to use BBS to mark recycled content, you would then need a different fluorophore, a different marker, if you will, to try and mark, okay, well, this can be sent off for something else. Um, but I now see that you said, for example, in construction. So I'm actually not quite sure what you're asking there. Um, and I have being informed that people cannot speak. So I have to read <laughs> all the, all the myself. Um, I don't know. I'm going to give a little bit uh, time for, for Steve to, to write about mm -hmm. the, to span a little bit about the, the construction part. I want to make you uh, another, another question. I've been uh, mentioning that you are already trying to uh, scale this up to, to take it to an industrial scale. What are the next steps? What are, do you think are the main barriers that we yeah. have to take this to, to the next level? Yeah, so I guess I'm no longer as um, not invested, that's not involved, sorry, uh, in the industrial part of this research, but uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Tom Bennett is, 
And so right now we're actually running large scale trials using this technology. So we've been giving automotive uh, plastics so plastic used in the automotive industry. Um, and we're trying to simulate the same results we've seen in the lab on the big scale. So I guess that's the our main question right now is, can we recreate this when we scale it up? Does it work with real life products rather than just, you know, highly controlled lab environments? So there's all sorts of variability in the plastic industry, such as additives, as I mentioned earlier, different molecules people use to protect plastics, plastic grades as well. So not not all HDPE, so or not all polyethylene is the same. You have different grades, which have different, again, additive pack packages, molecular weights. So it's this really complex plastic landscape that we're trying to navigate to see, well, okay, does this work at the big scale? Within six months, I hope I'll be able to give a proper answer to that question. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, we have a question from Christopher. Have you tried different uh, fluoros? force in the system. Do you see this working as a plastic sorting aid on top of recycling trucking? trucking? Um, so yes, we've tried, I think it's about seven or eight different fluorophores in the system. Um, so in the literature, there are numerous fluorophores which show aggregation um, enhanced emission. But the problem is that they're not on the same, you know, you can't buy them at the same scale. You'd have to synthesize them from scratch. So what we did is we looked at very common um, optical brighteners, so fluorescent whitening molecules. And we found that there are two or three that also show aggregation induced or aggregation, aggregation enhanced emission uh, that we could use for the same technology. Uh, I, they're not... I, we have a patent pending for this uh, technology, and I don't think those fluorophores are included, so I don't want to reveal too much right now. Mm -hmm. But there are, we do have alternatives, alternative fluorophores we could use as another kind of barrier to um, fraud, if you will. And then the second question was, do you see this working as a plastic sorting aid on top of recycling tracking? That's a very good question, actually. Um, so again, if to sort that this wouldn't really help you um sort between different types of plastics as we we use the same fluorophore across all plastics so we use the same one in polyethylene terephthalate as in polypropylene as in polyethylene but say we found this only really works in one kind of plastic then we would only include it in that one say hdpe which has a very large market share and then you could use it as a secondary sort to plastics, if that makes sense. But I also know that there's another uh, company that looks at using plastic sleeves on plastic bottles to sort between plastics and they fluoresce. It's not just blue and turquoise, it's you know blue, green, red, very distinct colors to try and help sort um, between plastic types. Okay, we have the comment from Steve regarding the construction thing. Uh, in terms of applications uh, that are less sensitive to degradation, uh, uh, this uh, has been suggested for recycled insulation, for example, as opposed to plastic packaging that needs to be more flexible, airtight, etc. Uh, he's happy to have a chat with you about this tomorrow, but I don't know if you want to comment something on this. So. Yeah, I think I think I can see that someone else asked the question before Steve as yeah. well about Copolymers. Yeah, I will go to that one. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Steve sits next to me in the office, so I'm happy to chat <laughs> tomorrow if we run out of time. <laughs> um, so uh, we have the question from Matt: um, yeah. Can this tracking system apply to copolymers co as well? That's a very good question that I don't have the answer to yet, as we haven't tried copolymers, but I think this is something that's definitely worth looking into, especially because, yes, no, I will, I can't, I, I don't know the answer now. I don't see why it wouldn't work, but it's something I'm gonna think about and shelf and actually have a look into. So thanks for the suggestion. Perfect. Uh, we have the question from Naomi. Uh, what might be the impact of uh, on uh, marine life ecosystem, et cetera, of using fluorescence in plastic? Not all plastics, uh, plastic will be recycled and might, might end up as plastic pollution in oceans where uh, sea creatures, uh, coral, et cetera, can emit use this fluorescence. So yeah. what's, what's your opinion about this? So, yeah, it's a very good point as well. Um, 
I mean, all plastic in the oceans, I think, is, is pretty awful. Um, but I think it's worth noting that most plastics already use some type of fluorescent brightener in them. In them. So I think it's something like over 80% of plastics have a fluorescent brightener in them already. So it's not about what impact will this have, it's what impact is it already having and how do we stop plastics from being released into the ocean in general. Um, so yeah, it's a big problem. Perfect. Uh, I don't think that we have more questions and actually we we have to continue with the next next speaker. So we're gonna give you a, a big round of applause. So we thank you for the presentation Thanks. and thank you for the, for answering all the questions. Uh, the next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Rafael Tarpani. He's a research assistant that is working, uh, no, sorry, research associate that is working the, at the Tyndall Center for Climate Change which is part of the department of uh, MACE. Uh, Rafael works uh, particularly with environmental life cycle assessment and um, introducing the principles of circular economy in different uh, sectors. And uh, today his uh, presentation um, is called Assessing the Environmental Impacts and Circularity of Digital Services for Health and Wellbeing. And uh, you can see my name there because I work with Rafa, we work uh, together. So whenever you are ready, Rafa. Thanks Alex for the introduction. So my name is Rafael Tarpani. Uh, we'll present now this project that the one that I'm currently mainly involved in, in my research associate position here at University of Manchester, it starting at the beginning of the year. Uh, I'm from Brazil. I got my master's in undergrad uh, degree in Brazil, and I have got my PhD here in Manchester in the chemical engineering analytical science in back in 2017. So I will start my presentation on the topic with a little bit of humor and also to set the tone and the mood for what's coming in the next slides so we can have a better context of what we are talking about here, uh, digitalization, digital service, the main topic. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm from Brazil, and I remember when I was growing up in the 90s, uh, I probably if you're the same age or older than me, you remember the internet wasn't a thing at that time. Uh, and I remember that I watched TV. We had three TV channels in Brazil. So there was not much competition of the, to watch on TV. But and we have other, other forms of entertainment that didn't involve electronic devices. And uh, I think the things change a bit in the last 20 years. We can see that uh, the way we interact with each other, the way we, we work and everything revolves now around technology in some way or another. And this changed very, very fast, right? In the last 20 years. And that's what's going on uh, in not only the way we work, but also in the healthcare sector. And um, I assume most of you are in Manchester, around Manchester, and here it was the birthplace of the first industrial revolution when we start to use steam and coal to produce and, and mechanize the process. That's the first industrial revolution. After that, we start to use oil and electricity in industry. Right after the Second World War, there comes the third industrial revolution. We, we start to use electricity and automated process. And now in the midst of the fourth, going to the fifth industrial revolution with smart cities, smart manufacturing. And this is um, made by the widespread use of electronic devices in every single aspect of our life with instant global communications of these devices through internet and intranet and all sorts of digital services. And what happens that um, things are coming so fast, this change is coming so fast. We have several big tech companies and services pushing this, this digitalization and consumption of digital services all around us. Some examples obvious are Google, Apple, Microsoft, Meta, and the other devices, electronic devices and digital services we use for entertainment in our laptops, Netflix, Spotify, so things that were before we had to go for a copy of a DVD to watch a movie are now in their laptop. But the thing here that I want, I will show in the next slides is that we have these electronic devices, but there's a whole infrastructure behind it 
And that's what should be also considered when you're using these devices. This is another um, bit of humor here in the presentation. What we have in, back in the 90s and before, we have one electronic devices for each of the tasks we've done. Uh, so we had a calculator to, to go to the school, but a radio at home, walk, talk, uh, recording machine, a radio, some uh, VHS tape, uh, those don't know what it is. And we had all this uh, in our lives, and it usually lasts for longer than two years, like we use our cell phone today. Most of people change every two or three years. And those electronic devices, they last much longer, and we because we use them less or they are built to last longer. And now things to be uh, seem to be a little bit more disposal. And and uh, what's not showing here in the this picture is the whole infrastructure needed to the single cell phone, for instance, to be able to substitute all these electronic devices. That's the internet infrastructure that I mentioned before. I'll give more details later, and you have to be taken into account when you're understanding what uh, these digital digitalization, digital services uh, have in, in, uh, in the environment and in our lives. For instance, the good impacts of the digitalization environment might be that all the CDs, VHS tapes are now in the cloud. We have uh, instant access to them through streaming platforms. And right now we are having this on Zoom. We don't have to meet, so we don't, the necess necessity of transportation is decreased. We can have uh, all pretty much all the social and work interactions through platforms like this. Uh, and all this data being transferred, all this um, data information being stored in the cloud and these big tech companies having access to them and other ventures can help us, can uh, enable the use of uh, machine learning, learning, artificial intelligence to give us different perspectives on how to tackle some issues, uh, not only social, but environmental and any kind of um, issues that we, as a humans, we don't have the perspective in this from this uh, amount of data that's not possible for a human to to understand and and uh, have some grasp. And uh, this allows optimization of supply chains. We can better monitor control losses, for instance, when distributing products. Let's re remember how Amazon de delivers their products in one day. That was unimaginable, like ten years ago. We can, understand, we can get this data from machine learning, uh, from big data and use machine learning and artificial intelligence to better design products that last longer or use different materials that would be more beneficial to the environment. And now in the fifth industrial revolution, we can also use digital twins and cyber physical systems to be even more efficient when dealing with the resources available. And uh, the downsides, the dark side of digitalization that I will comment a little bit later, is the, 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 as I mentioned before, the in infrastructure for them to, to be present every day of our lives and every instant. We need a whole um, uh, infrastructure containing servers, data centers, and cables interconnecting them to all over the world. And this consumes around 0 0.08 kilowatt hour per gigabyte being transferred, uh, the, the, the latest estimations. So you can imagine that Netflix movie has around six gigabytes. So every time you watch a movie on Netflix has a carbon footprint roughly of uh, 200 grams of CO2 equivalent. Um, that's why sometimes Amazon asks you if you're still watching your, your content because it is, has a very impact in, your, in, in the environment and for these data centers to work. We also have a water consumption for humidity and temperature control of these data centers. It's around 0.74 liters per gigabyte being transferred. And uh, this is the environmental aspect. But what can also happen and definitely happens is that the, all this data being transferred can be, can be understood to improve supply chains, but can also be used to manipulate our perspectives and how the way we use products, we, the products we use, and how we understand what's going to, to be studied or not. And that's uh, the, an, another downside. And just to make it clear, we can, uh, even though can be this the infrastructure more efficient, the way we, uh, we use digitalization, digital services ever increasing, and it's going to increase for a long time. 
And but we live in a finite planet, and we have to understand what is the impact of providing such such service because we don't have infinite resources. We have to better use them, and uh, so it's it becomes more sustainable the the digitalization of these services. And that brings me to the the our role in the Universal Manchester in this project that I will give more details next. We are going to assess the circular circularity and the life cycle assessment of these digital devices and of the digital service for e-health uh, in example that I'll give you next. For the circular economy part, what we went, what the idea here is to try to decouple economic growth from environmental impacts. We have some set of strategies and um, principles to follow. For instance, in the case of electronic devices, to try to, to use them less, doing the same uh, function, close material loops in the, of the materials containing them, to narrow the uses of uh, material and energy, and regenerate whenever possible, for instance, the energy being, being used for them to work. We also have the aspect of quantifying the environmental impacts of these strategies and of the service as a whole. We use life cycle assessment. It's a methodology that we try to understand from cradle to grave, all the resources necessary and for, for, for the services and for the electronic device. And what are the emissions and, and uh, other ways associated to, to the service and quantify this in around 15 to 18 different environmental impacts and check what are the hotspots of these environmental impacts and if there are trade-offs in terms of different strategies to decrease environmental impacts of these services. And let's not forget that we are, we are trying also in this project to assess how much data is being transferred during the services and the impacts that they have that not only as directly associated to the, to the digital uh, digital service itself. And now being more specific about the, the healthcare, this is an example of what it means, digitalization, the health service. Tele, we usually define digitalization health services, telehealth and telemedicine. The first one is more non-clinical services and the second one clinical, but there are also services for well-being and organization monitoring of uh, supply chains associated to healthcare services. Uh, and these are, I included a figure to illustrate what is the health services with digitalization being increased adopted. Uh, it's a really nice paper published in 2020 that assessed the cataract after the, sur the surgery for cataract in some patients. What they did is they uploaded the image of, after the surgery of the eye of, of the, 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 these patients and using AI in a cloud, in a database, they could compare if this particular patient would need or not in further intervention. And when they need it, the, the, there is automatic service that texts them in their cell phones and could better organize their visit to the GP or for the, the, clin the, with the clinician. And that definitely makes the process more efficient. And now I'm going to, the, to our, pro uh, well, our project in more detail. What we are doing in this project here in University of Manchester in collaboration with other universities here in the UK is to assess this uh, health and well-being service in living schemes in the UK for elderly people. Uh, we are assessing three different ones with three, uh, two, around 200 occupiers. And uh, I think I'll give more details next about the, each of these electronic devices. But basically what they do is communicate the occupiers with caretakers in these facilities and also allows them to control who is coming in and out from the facilities, visitors, or someone who might be help them or visiting them, and uh, also urgent not notifications. The main devices is here in live, live Living Hub number A, the, the one in green. It's some sort of tablets that allows the, the occupiers to have all the video communication and also to, to say if they are okay, and if they can, if they need some help, they can send uh, notifications or communicate with the caretaker in their office room or any other location in, in these living schemes. And for that, we need associate infrastructure server room 
that uh, needs needs to control all this electronic uh, data and information being man being transferred around this living scheme, it, which is connected to the cloud. And uh, this give you more detail about the project between before going to the results that we have up to now after eight months in this project. The, the, the first work package is related to improving this methodological framework to assess digital devices for e-health and uh, digital service, sorry. And uh, this, we are going in the group of um, social scientists and here people from the University of Manchester. We visit these schemes with, a group of, with this group of social scientists to understand how these occupiers and caretakers uh, interact with these electronic devices, what they think about this digital service, to, be, to get insights of how these electronic devices and the service, the, the service is being used by, by these living schemes and understanding what is need to, to, to provide them in this living in the, in the housing scheme. And uh, work package three, we try to disseminate the, these insights in the, with, and how they can be further used in the healthcare system as a whole. Uh, we, we, we have collaboration with NHS, so we can get the, all this info and try to understand how this can, they can be applied in a broader scale. And work package four, we have the co-creation uh, with, with different stakeholders from the healthcare, but also and, and uh, associates, um, um, uh, stakeholders that can help us to disseminate the, the knowledge that we have from this project and from the NHS to so, uh, different kind of uh, healthcare services. And I'm um, going, and uh, we are responsible in here in Manchester work package five and six, as I mentioned before, uh, work package five is the environmental impact and circularity assessment of the service. And work package six, I'll give some results at the end. It's very interesting. We are trying to to monitor and minimize the environmental product, uh, the environmental impacts of our project uh, itself by trying to understand every task that we do every week and what are the impacts of these tasks. In a bit more details about work package six, uh, five, sorry, we're going to dis we are dismantling these electronic devices to try to search for parts that can be reused, recycle materials and how they can use less energy to provide these services. Important to notice that we are, we, are, we are creating a framework to try to assess not only the materials, but the energy consumption and data usage of this service as a whole, because these are interconnected, as I mentioned in the previous uh, slides. And uh, we are going, here going to show very interesting results that we had when we dismantling this, this service, these electronic devices. Uh, the main one is A, the living hub, but here I'm showing the pictures of all of them. Uh, we, this, we took these devices to the technicians here at the University of Manchester. We dismantled them. We recorded everything that was necessary, every tool that was necessary to dismantle them. Uh, we, we check all the parts, uh, what they are made for, of, and how long it took, and if any part of them broke. This will help us to understand the how difficult is to maintain them and, and what's the capacity to use reuse to use parts from other products if in case they they have some uh, problems and what can be done um, after their end of life and that's what i'm going now towards the end of the presentation the 20 minutes it's to show that for instance for the printed super boards all of all of these electronic devices have one uh, we're going to, to check how it's the best route to recover the metals from their microchips or the printed circuit board, board as a whole, uh, and what we should search for when they reach their life cycle, their the end of their life cycle. What's the best route? The same thing for our batteries. We are searching uh, what kind of metals can be actually recovered from these batteries. Um, how can better utilize them so they can last longer? And what's the best routes in the UK to, to, uh, to recover these metal, metals after the end of life? Uh, some interesting results here. We have some the main materials uh, in, the, in weight of these electronic devices are for casing, 
Uh, and about 10 to 30% are the printed secret boards. And for some of them, the battery is uh, very important in terms of weight. We have also that um, some metals like aluminum steel are responsible for more than 300 grams for in what, just one device. And we have around, we have 200 occupiers, so we have more than 200 devices. So we're gonna analyze this is for the digital service as a whole, not per uh, device. And we're going to assess 18 different environmental impacts here. And uh, just to finish, we have really nice uh, results for the environmental impacts, the work, work package six. Um, so there's the amount of data being transferred in the project and uh, the impacts of having meetings uh, during the last six months and uh, the climate change potential and of the product in the, as a whole. And the next steps, finishing the environmental impacts assessment and circular of these electronic devices and of the running the project as a whole. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Rafa, for the, for the presentation. Um, I think we have a couple of questions. Um, Sam is saying uh, in the cycle of source and recycling, you just miss a very important part, laborer. In most global South countries, this kind of dirty, harmful uh, works are done by kids, illegal workers, low wages, no, no half uh, cover, less than a dollar per day, even slaves. Uh, this, again, is not a question. And it's, it's, it's yeah. not, I don't know if you want to add something, Rafa. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just add a bit. In, uh, I didn't have time to go in more detail, but in the framework we are trying to create to assess these digital services, indeed, we are going to, to structure it to uh, assess the environmental impacts, but also the social aspects as well of producing these electronic devices and dismantling and reusing them. So that, that's definitely part of the project. Perfect. Uh, we have a comment from or question from uh, Meda. Uh, have you heard research about Fairphone, uh, which could be easily reportable? Do you think it could revolutionize the phone market? I, I think we, we, we talk about this during the project. <laughs> um, so I think th this is, it comes from the main difficulty in assessing the environmental impacts of uh, any kind of product or service. It, that, it depends of the, the user, um, so, and the quantities is being generated. Okay, the bottom line is, um, in my opinion, if uh, how it, we have to understand if it's better for an environment to use this, what's the, the name of? Fairphone, yeah. Fair Would phone. Be better, better to use a, a Fairphone for one year or an Apple for 10 years. Uh, so that's the sort of balance that we have to, 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 to check first. Did we start analyze? I, I, cannot, I cannot say about the results, but there, there is the whole market behind that we have also to understand how, how it works before saying it can re revolutionize something, but it's a definitely a good start. I'm a Fairphone user. I don't know. <laughs> uh, my personal experience is that, mm -hmm. yeah, it's very, it can be very easily dismantled. Mm -hmm. But what we cannot do is try to uh, sell something as more sustainable if it doesn't have a right performance, okay? Which is what happened in my experience with this phone, you know? Yeah, very sustainable, but in, in less than one year and a half, I have to change the battery three times, you know, which is very easy to, to, to change, but not very sustainable because it's one of the parts of a mobile that is less sustainable so but obviously this is a personal experience okay but i'm a user of fairphone and yeah very easy to dismantle but maybe they have to improve their batteries and uh, yeah. um one uh, no problem let uh, say thank you for this <laughs> personal type um i think uh, i'm gonna do we have another question matt uh, Will legislation, legislation such as those in Europe that are forcing Apple to switch to USB-C instead of the lighting cable um, uh, have a large effect on consumer e-waste? I believe that there are also pushes um, 
uh, towards making legislations to allow funds to be easily repairable instead of going to a specific licensed shop. So basically, I think to summarize, I think Matt uh, try, try, is trying to say, do you think that policies can influence all of this in a positive way? Yes, um, I think we are in the start of that. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, things are changing so, so fast. In 20 years, our, the way we done things change completely and it's hard to understand what's going coming next. I think this is definitely a start, but um, as I mentioned before, I think consumer behavior, it plays a, a whole, it, uh, the primary role, role on this and legislations come next. But I think it's a good way to start to create some feedback. So the people who are buying and the companies are aware that some things should be prioritized during the, the design of products, uh, even though definitely not enough, <laughs> but it's a, a good beginning to, to introduce different policies, thinking about not only the customers or profit, but also the environment and how people use and how can reuse some um, equipment and resources that we use for, for electronic devices. Perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. We have uh, one comment uh, from now. Naomi regarding uh, suggesting some potential uh, blue mm -hmm. light uh, filter, which is clearly related with this kind of devices, and it's, it's, it's important to protect ourselves in this uh, mm -hmm. sense. And nice. I don't think that there is uh, any more questions, and we are on time. Before um, uh, we go, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, both our presenters for the great presentation and answering of questions. So a round of applause again for Zoe and uh, Rafa. Thank you very much. Uh, two uh, brief uh, reminders. Um, these uh, Sustainable Future Seminars are open to everyone that wants to present um, their, their work. So please, if you are interested to present uh, next year, is every we do these seminars with the same format every month. Please contact uh, Lauren uh, Mullen, okay, which is super effective and already have put um, uh, her email in the chat. Please contact uh, Lauren if you are interested for seminars in 2023. And another uh, event that I want to highlight is that the 28th of November from 11 to 2, we are going to have a showcase uh, event, you know, to commemorate the first year of, of Sustainable Futures. So uh, the challenge uh, leads, uh, like myself, are going to explain the work that we are doing, and we are going to have some very interesting uh, presentations regarding uh, research. So that's the 28th of November from 11 to uh, 2. And uh, if you are part of the newsletters of um, Sustainable uh, Futures, you will receive all the information. And again, Lauren is super efficient and has put the, um, the link to, um, uh, to the Evan, Evan Bright uh, page where you can get all the information regarding this um, celebration uh, showcase. So I think we are just on time. So. Thank you everyone for attending the, the seminar. Thank you to the presenters. And I hope to see you in the next uh, Sustainable Future Seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you.